The next cardiomyopathy is endomyocardial fibrosis, which is quite common and it's quite easy to diagnose because it has characteristic appearances. Patients with endomyocardial fibrosis are not the kind who, who come, let's say, as the patients who come with granulomatous cardiomyopathy. Those patients are hale, hearty, walking. Patients who have EMF are invariably the majority of the times admitted with heart failure and are sick, okay, because they have an ongoing inflammatory process. And typically you see this arrow-shaped diffuse subendocardial enhancement. It's not infarction because it is not territory bound and it is arrow-shaped on your four-chamber view, which is the view on which we make the diagnosis. It may only involve the LV. It may only involve the RV or in this case you see that it is biventricular. You will find restriction of the RV and LV on the cine images, dilatation of the RA and LA as you would with any restrictive cardiomyopathy. But this is, this is your diagnostic clue, arrow shaped diffuse subendocardial enhancement that you would see in the ventricular cavity. Another patient who also has RV and LV involvement, but the RV involvement is substantial. It has resulted in a significant reduction and restriction of the RV cavity and see the size of the RA. It's just completely ballooned out and has pericardial effusion. This patient passed away, I think, within about seven days of the cardiac MR being done. They just couldn't do anything for this patient. And lastly, we come to thalassemia where cardiac MR has completely changed survival as far as this entity is concerned. See, we all know thalassemia is common. We know it exists in our country. We know that people do a pretty good job of controlling stuff with blood transfusions, but then they live, right? And once they live beyond the age of 15, 16, 18 years, all that blood transfusion results in iron overload. Now, we know that chelating agents are given for the liver, but the reason they die at the age of 20-25 is because of heart failure due to iron overload in the heart. There is a way of controlling, removing and preventing iron overload in the heart, but the drug is different from the one that is typically used for the liver. So whether to give it or not when, and the way in which you would treat depends upon whether there is iron overload in the heart or no. Because iron is a ferromagnetic substance, you can use its T2 star properties. You need a multi-echo gradient sequence which tracks the uh, loss because of the paramagnetic effect of the T2 star. And then based upon this, we have a software which actually calculates the approximate iron content within the septum or the myocardium. So typically if your iron content is less than 20 milliseconds of T2 star, that means that there is iron overload. Anything less than 8 is severe and anything between 8 and 12 we call moderate. This is currently the largest indication for which we do cardiac MR, but we do that as a social cause simply because uh, we were roped into this to do it as a trial project and thalassemics have no money simply because they use it all up doing blood transfusions. And remember, if you're going to have two people with thalmina marrying today in this day and age, they're not of the socioeconomic status to have understood that they should have got themselves tested before they married. So typically they come from a poor socioeconomic status um, little uneducated and on top of that the recurring cost of you know just keeping the child alive so you know essentially we just do this because it seems to help now based on this our hematologists they change the chelation they 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 titrate them and they actually come for repeat cardiac MRs every year um, and we can track whether they are improving or not so this is this is something that we do on an, on an absolute uh, regular basis then we come to the primary cardiomyopathies. We have hypertrophic, ARVC, and non-compaction. Among the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, apical hypertrophy is, is reasonably common. These patients present with large inverted uh, T waves. Uh, they usually come for health checkups. They get an ECG done. Somebody sees these giant waves and, you know, they kind of freak out. You do an echo, echo is normal because the apex touches the, the heart and a lot of times you can't appreciate apical hypertrophy, but MR is very good. You see this um, systolic obliteration of the LV, 
You see this spade-like config. It looks like the ace of spades, basically, but in an inverted form. And this is classic apical hypertrophy. Virtually all the times these patients are asymptomatic, but we need to do the delayed hyperenhanced images to see whether there is necrosis or fibrosis or not. But we do now MRs in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy simply because there is now a lot of data available which shows that if there is abnormal enhancement in the hypertrophied myocardium, it suggests necrosis and fibrosis and this correlates directly with the incidence of sudden cardiac death, which means if you have a lot of fibrosis and necrosis, the chance that you will have a sudden cardiac death event is high. What does that mean? The patient needs to get an, an AICD or an, um, a, a cardio defibrillator put in uh, right away. And then, of course, the patient will never come back for a cardiac MR, so you can't do a follow-up study. But nevertheless, uh, these patients are prime candidates for putting AICD. So our EP guys will call us and say, I have a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I'm not interested in the measurements of the uh, extent of subaortic obstruction. Just tell me what is the extent of fibrosis so that I can decide whether or not I need to put a pacemaker inside. So here is a typical patient, 35-year-old, has almost symmetric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy large areas of fibrosis, necrosis, whatever you call it, within the anterior wall and the lateral wall and the apex. You can see that on the short axis views. That's the septum. That's the anterior wall. The extent of fibrosis, necrosis is almost more than 60 to 70 percent of the entire volume of hypertrophied muscle. This patient is a prime candidate for getting a pacemaker put in right away. The other dysplasia we work with is a ARVD or arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, which essentially is a genetic disorder where there is fibrofatty uh, infiltration of the right ventricle and degeneration, and eventually these patients go into right ventricular failure. In the ARVD protocol, which is a shade different from the rest of the cardiomyopathy protocol, we also do straight transverse um, cine images because they allow us to see the RV wall very well. And we add on T1 weighted spinnaco images to see if there is fat infiltration within the myocardium. But please remember, fat infiltration occurs very late in the uh, disease process and e you can diagnose ARVD even without fat infiltration. You can see here the RV wall is crinkly. It's showing a lot of akinesia, abnormal um, wall motion here. If you focus here on the four chamber, in, the, in RV systole, can you appreciate this outpouching? In systole, something of the RV is going out like a pseudo-saculation, pseudo-aneurysm. Can you appreciate that? Yep, that is abnormal and this is pathognomonic of ARVD. Okay, you, if you see this in the absence of fat infiltration as well, this is ARVD. Of course, this patient also has fat within the RV, which is very well seen on the T1 weighted images, but you don't have to have that. We also do delayed hyperenhanced images, and typically we see that whenever there's fat infiltration, they will have abnormal enhancement as well. Another developmental condition is non compaction. See, you have this compact myocardium, right, which is very, very thick and, you know, crisp and well-defined. But it starts actually off as spongy myocardium, which then compacts. Now, if you have failure of compaction and the ratio of non-compacted to compacted is greater than 2, then it's non-compaction. And these patients also can present with sudden cardiac death. And you see here that all this spongy myocardium in the four-chamber views is so much thicker than the compacted crisp myocardium. You can appreciate this even in your two chambers, especially when you look at these mid um, cavitary images, and you can appreciate this. This is a spot diagnosis once you've seen it. It's best made on MR, though you could do it on ultrasound, and these patients usually, depending on their symptomatology, need to go for treatment. Okay, we come to the mixed ones. You have dilated cardiomyopathy or restrict, you know, basically these patients have had some episode of viral myocarditis. Suddenly somebody does an echo or they come with failure. You find reduced ejection fraction. 
there's diffuse symmetric hypokinesia of all LV segments. This is very different from let's say sarcoid, TB, all the others where there is asymmetric patchy hypokinesia. This is diffuse symmetric and on the delayed hyperenhanced images you see virtually no enhancement, no fibrosis or very little sometimes you know, just a minimal amount of fibrosis or an enhancement which pretty much tells you that this is idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. What do we mean by idiopathic DCM? That by and large these patients have had a viral myocarditis in the past. You have, like I said, the acquired myocarditis, Takosubo, etc. What we are seeing these days are patients who have postpartum as well. But this is something you see. Patient comes with acute chest pain. Um, uh, they find raised enzymes uh, immediately and uh, 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 cardiac CT or uh, catheter angio is done. Coronaries are normal. Now, coronary is normal, raised enzymes, young patient. Uh, if they come for cardiac MR at that time, you may see these areas of mid-myocardial enhancement, little patchy, but this eventually will go into idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy or the patient may improve uh, completely as well. But when you see this pattern in an acute subacute setting with this clinical profile, this is viral myocarditis or acute myocarditis. And you've got inflammation here. This is not fibrosis. This is just inflammation that is also enhancing after giving contrast. This is a patient with postpartum failure. They by and large look like idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. You have uh, large LVs. You have uh, usually... Uh, symmetric diffuse hypokinesia, but sometimes you may have it patchy as well. The way you make this diagnosis is because this patient is peripartum or postpartum, and that's basically how uh, we come to this. Some of these patients will show enhancement in fibrosis. This patient didn't, and as I said, for some reason, the incidence of this has been um, increasing, or maybe, and I suspect this is true, um, um, of everything. We used to say multiple sclerosis doesn't exist in India. I mean, you know, 20 years ago that was the rule. Or when I was a registrar in Cyan, I was told pulmonary thromboembolism doesn't occur in India except in Parsis um, because they come from a different white stock. Um, and then we were told sarcoid doesn't exist in India. You can never make a diagnosis. Crohn's disease doesn't exist in India. Well, guess what? Everything exists. We didn't know how to diagnose them. And I presume that's the same with postpartum failure. It is common enough, but we just didn't know how to diagnose it. And now the EP guys and, you know, the awareness is increasing. We're actually able to pick these up as well. So that was as far as cardiomyopathies was concerned. Just to recap, we have our primary genetic hypertrophic ARVC non-compaction, not uncommon. In HCM, in fact, you pick up one patient, it's good for business. You then have to go and scan the rest of the family as well, right? Because it's genetics. You have the brother, the sister, the father, you know, everybody comes in. So you get about, for one patient, you get another four or five coming in for screening. Um, the same is not, it's supposed to be true for ARVCs, but somehow these patients don't get their families screened. And non-compaction is not common, okay? Um, DCMs, dilated cardiomyopathies, your myocarditis, not uncommon. Uh, they come in for cardiac MR just so that the EP guys can see whether there's a structural uh, area of fibrosis which correlates with their electrophysiology studies. Never seen a Takosubo, but postpartum is becoming common. Um, sarcoid TB all the time, amyloidosis, lot in literature, but we don't see, I've just seen a couple cases, also probably because these patients are very sick and very often have a diagnosis of amyloidosis uh, elsewhere and then you just make a correlation. EMF, not uncommon. Um, SLE scleroderma, etc. When you have a patient with SLE or scleroderma and the patient comes with a cardiac problem, you assume that they are connected. So there's no real reason to do cardiac MR unless you're doing some research trial or study. And of course, we do a lot of iron estimation and thalassemia because that's something that really makes a difference to these patients. So thank you for your attention. I think we've covered viability and cardiomyopathies and maybe we have, a time, we have time for a couple of questions.